Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. It's Easter Monday, and we're approaching the last week of the NHL regular season for this year. And the, the Flames are in a bit of a dangerous position this week, as uh, myself, Dan, and my co-host, Matt, join you again to talk Flames hockey. How you doing, buddy? Oh, good. Nervous times in Flames Nation. Have a good Easter? Oh, yeah. It was my birthday yesterday, so celebrated well, that as well. Well, Matt, we had... Uh... A, sh- a quiet week for the Flames. Only two games this week. Uh, neither of us predicted this week correctly. Uh, we'll get into that later. But Flames started off the week. They, well, since we talked last anyways, they played on Thursday against the Blues. And I said to you at the end of last week's show, I said, that's a game that could get away from the Flames. And they lost that one 4-1. to one. And the Blues, when I looked at that game, came out playing the way the Blues can play. Like They outmatched the Flames in pretty much every department. What was your thought on that one? Yeah, uh, when you're facing a cup contending team and you're a bubble playoff team, uh, games like what happened in St. Louis happen. You're just outclassed. Like it, especially a trap team like the St. Louis Blues, you're, each one of your lines has to be as good as the Blues to even have a chance. And the only line for Calgary that was close was the Gaudreau line. And all the other lines were just unable to do anything with the Blues' defense. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, they were... Yeah, you're right. The Blues really, you could tell, didn't come out going gangbusters. They knew who they were playing against, and they played the trap, but I felt like they also slowed Calgary down a lot more than we've seen in any other game this year. I I could almost see in the Flames play, they were getting frustrated by the Blues making them change their tempo and change their game a little bit. Well, it's not often that you face a team that's as good at trapping as a Ken Hitchcock coached team. So it's one of those things that the Flames need to take lessons from that to become more versatile as we move forward into next season. So that way, teams like St. Louis don't catch us off guard with playing really extremely tight, stingy defense. And, you know, it's one of the reasons the Blues are doing as well as they are this year. Oh, yeah, exactly. And realistically, when you're going for a Stanley Cup, you need a a coach that does preach a good, tight defensive system. And there's not many better out there than Hitch. No, uh, the only other guys that are, in my mind, that are as good are Quenville in Chicago, Sutter in L.A., and uh, Tippett in Arizona. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure on my side I'd put Tippett in that list, but uh, above Hitch, I think he might, I don't know. Well, it's it's close enough. It's a debate for another day, but yeah. Yeah, but no, those guys are all the top guys. And if you look at all those players that, or all those coaches, they're coaching top players on co- on top teams, and that's why their teams are doing as well as they are. Yeah, you need the talent to back it up. Like If you look at a team like Arizona, they play a tight defensive style, but they don't have any talent whatsoever on the team, and they're at the bottom. Yeah, well, a lot of that has to do with the fact they decided to sell. Well, true. <laughs> on, on deadline day. I mean, they had talent there. It's not like they've been terrible all year. They just sold everybody they could at the last minute. Yeah, which I don't blame them. <laughs> no, I mean, they had a goal, and you know what? They're probably going to get what they yeah. want. They're probably going to end up getting one of the top two guys. Yeah. So it shows Edmonton that you can be crappy, not all year, just at the end, and still end up beating Edmonton at their own game. True. Speaking of Edmonton... Why don't we move on to the second game of the week? Um, a game that, you know, I said last week, I think is f- probably going to be the Battle of Alberta that for the last couple of years, the only one that's really mattered in the grand scheme of things because Calgary needed the win. And the Flames came out and played the game I expected them to against the Oilers and got the result I was expecting against the Oilers. We ended up with a 4 nothing shutout in that game. Yeah, th- how would you say it? Edmonton, this was their Stanley Cup. And in the first 30 minutes of the game, 
Edmonton was actually the better team, even though the Flames had a one nothing lead. But uh, it is Edmonton, and you see a player like Taylor Hall making so many turnovers at their own blue line. It eventually came back to bite them, and the Flames just won. <laughs> you know, the, a team like Edmonton, you don't even have to try that hard to get a 4 nothing win. <laughs> It was interesting looking at the uh, scoreboard after that game. Um, Marcus Granlin and Josh Juris both got two points in the night. Granlin got two goals and Juris assisted them both. And the other odd thing is if you look at the penalty summary, there was only one penalty the whole game, and it was in the third period when Keith Ollie got ca- got caught cross-checking Joe Colborn. But I was expecting a game that was going to have a lot more, especially from maybe Edmonton, um, a lot more chippy play in it. Well... Edmonton's kind of a pushover. That's part of the reason why they're not gaining any success is that they they don't have the fundamentals of how to win down properly. And there's no fight in them. And it, it's just a matter of being patient and out skating and outlasting them. Because they will try, but they kind of suck. And... And we saw that in that game, too. They came out, like you said, the better team. I thought they were playing better for the whole first period and part of the second, but we outlasted them and stuck with our game, and we ended up wearing them down. Yeah, well, once Granlin scored late in the second period, like that just ended their game. And it, Yeah, that seemed to be when they just fell apart after that Which, point. if you hearken back to the first time we played them this season, the Oilers had a 2-1 lead after two periods, and then the Flames scored the equalizer, and that just ended the Oilers' night, and the Flames ended up coasting to a 5-2 victory. So... The game plan when you play the Oilers is just hold on and try not to allow them to get anything in on the goaltenders and you'll be good to go. And after this week, uh, the St. Louis game was actually the last game in our final seven-game series for the year. We have a couple games left, but not a full series. And we lost that series. The St. Louis game uh, was a 4-3 loss on that seven-game series. It started on March 21st. Um it would have been a seven-game series if it was a playoff series. We lost in seven. And, Matt, that gives the Flames an 8-3 record on the seven-game series this year. A lot better than I'm sure every Flames fan was expecting. And full marks to the coaching staff for making them competitive because I do believe that two of the losses were both seven-game series with the only blowout being when we lost those eight games in a row in December. So it's good that the Flames are resilient, even if they aren't successful, to make the other teams work for it. Yeah, looking at the stats here, the December road trip between uh, December 11th and December 22nd, we won one game and lost six, and that would have been a... uh, that would have been a four game series. We lost four in a row, and that was the only time, like you said, we really let things go on us. The next loss that we had was February 18th to March 5th, and that was a seven-game se- or that was a sorry a five-game series, and then this would have been a seven-game series. But you know, even if you look at it, the Flames won the first four series uh, in a row. So if we looked at this as a playoff team, you know, that would have been enough to get you to the finals. Yeah, and it's remarkable a team that is full of youth and inexperience is able to show that kind of fortitude to be able to keep going and pushing and pushing and pushing. Usually younger teams like the Flames end up collapsing due to mistakes that creep into their game. When the pressure comes up down the stretch, they wilt under the pressure. But guys like Gaudreau that have been the best players all the way through. Yeah. Yeah, and that's nice to see. It's nice to see some consistency on that perspective. Well, it's been a bit of a dangerous week for the Flames. We didn't get as many points as we needed. I think that, you know, losing to St. Louis really hurt us on the week. And we're still sitting third in the Pacific Division right now. But we're only one point up on both LA and Winnipeg as of uh, points that are on the board right now. And Winnipeg is winning as we record this. 
So that's going to drop us probably right out of even the wild card contention. Yeah, and Los Angeles is also winning. So there you if go. Uh, those scores hold true, then uh, both LA and uh, Winnipeg will have 94 points to our 93 with the same amount of games played. Interestingly enough, uh, Vancouver has 95 points, and they'll only have two games remaining. So it might even be possible that the Flames might make the playoffs, the Kings and the Jets might make the playoffs, and Vancouver could be on the outside. It's possible. I don't see it happening, but it's possible. Yeah. They'd have to lose to both Arizona and Edmonton, which would make it even more hilarious, but, <laughs> you know. Stranger things have happened. If we look at the week upcoming for all these teams, the Flames have Arizona, LA, and Winnipeg, so they're playing two games in there against LA and Winnipeg. They're directly going to affect their standings. Uh, the Kings are playing Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, and San and uh, San Jose. So a couple games there that will directly affect them. And the Jets play Minnesota, St. Louis, Colorado, and Calgary. So as far as you know, games that can directly affect your standings. The Flames have the most must-win games against guys around them in, or teams around them in the standings. And that's what you want. Uh, you don't want to have to hope that other teams lose. It's up to the Flames to go out and beat them. And if they do, they'll be playing against likely Vancouver in the first round. If not, then they'll pack it in... Uh, on uh, the 11th. I think it's interesting that, you know, where we are now in the season that we couldn't have predicted at the beginning, even if we thought the team was going to make the playoffs, the two of our final three games are against teams that we need the points because one of those three at least is going to make it. So I think that's kind of interesting that down to the wire, we have these games that are going to be so important to us because they're against the, the teams that are within a point of us in the standings. Who would have figured? Yeah, no, it'll, it'll definitely be an interesting week. I think it's probably, and as long as I can remember, probably since 2004, the last week of the season that I'm most intrigued to keep watching. I know last year I didn't really care, you know, last week of the season. We all knew where we were going to be. And as you said, we could be in the playoffs. We could not be in the playoffs. We might sit here on the 11th after the uh, matinee game against uh, Winnipeg and say, wow, what a great season. And now it's time to hit the golf course. So it's going to be really interesting this year, this week to see what happens. Yeah, and the Flames can finish as low as ninth. So if the Flames do end up missing the playoffs, they will be just missing, not hitting 10th or 11th or 12th. So if they do lose, they'll have the lottery ticket for McDavid, which is extremely unlikely to be cashed in, but, you know. You know what, though? I mean, as much as it's extremely unlikely, wouldn't that be an amazing end of the season if we were to, say, miss by two points and win the McDavid lottery? Yeah, you could. after that, you could pretty much start uh, getting the 2017 Stanley Cup already engraved. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Start making sure you know everyone's spellings of their names. (laughs) Well, that would would be an amazing end of the season. Well, we'll see. It, It... It's up to the Flames to do what they're going to do. And that's been how it's been all season. And nobody anticipated them doing anything. And they have earned every single point this year. And it's up to them to make the playoffs. If they elevate their game against the Kings and the Jets, they will. If not, they'll at least have learned some good lessons heading into next year and have held their head held their head high especially after losing Mark Giordano last month since he he went down the Flames have actually been playing at a 105 point pace so uh, everybody has elevated their game and it's a good thing to see even if they do ultimately fall short they've done everything that anyone could have ever hoped for oh for sure and more exactly well, Matt, we talked about the Edmonton game. We talked about where the Flames are in the standings. The big question mark to me coming into this week that we didn't have, say, when we hit the ice in Rexall Place is the goalie situation. Uh, as we know, Kerry Ramos started uh, for the Flames in Edmonton, 
And within the first minute of the game, he was down and out, and apparently he's got a groin injury. Uh, Hiller came in and saved the day for the Flames, got the shutout. A little bit sad for those guys. The Flames, the team, get credited with a shutout, but neither individual goaltender gets credited with a shutout. And the question now becomes, what do we do? Um, as we all know, Yoni Ordeo is out, so we can't call him up. So the Flames have had to reach down deep on the depth chart to the fourth uh, guy on the depth chart, the backup in Adirondack, and bring Brad Teason up. Um, but I don't know. What What are your thoughts there? Do you think he's going to – well, let's start with this. Do you think he's going to get any minutes as a Flame this season? I, unless Hiller gets shot <laughs> between now and the end of the week, I, I don't see Teason – dressing and if he does I that's not good <laughs> i i feel bad for adirondack because they've lost both their goaltenders now so they got to go with doug carr and it looks like uh they actually brought in the calgary dinos the university of calgary's backstop uh jacob de uh to play down there as well yeah and for uh anybody that uh didn't watch the uh flames play the dinos back in september Deserez actually kept the Dinos in the game for most of it and was actually better than the Flames goalie at that time. So he should be able to play decently if he does dress at all for Adirondack. Yeah, and you know, he's it's not like he's an unknown. Uh, he was drafted in the third round, 84th overall in 2008 by the Flyers. Uh, so he's a guy who, you know, at least somebody saw some potential in. Third round is still pretty high for a goaltender. He played in the WHL for both Seattle and Brandon, and one year in the QMJHL for the St. John Sea Dogs, and ever since 2011, he's been playing for the UFC. So, yeah, a guy who has some experience at a high level. And I don't know, it'll be interesting to see if him or uh, Doug Carr are the better goaltender, but I wouldn't be surprised to see them both back here next year, at least for the Flames uh, prospect camp, to get a look. Yeah, they've all played adequately like even uh Thiessen, who's not an nhl caliber goaltender he's played okay in adirondack he's not he's an ahl backup and and that's the scary thing is like you said if if hiller goes down we're screwed pretty much yeah and unfortunately in the ncaa well fortunately providence is in the final four so the earliest their season could end is on Thursday if they lose in their first contest. So if Hiller goes down, the earliest that uh, Gillies could play is against Winnipeg, which I Yeah, think... so the transfer agreement says you cannot bring in an NCAA player to the NHL until their season is done. Yeah, so we'll see. And the, the other rule not a lot of people might know is the Flames could try to go out and get a free agent goaltender, but if you're not on a team's roster as of, I believe it's 5 p.m. on trade deadline day, you're not eligible to play in the playoffs. So even if we were to go out and try to sign you know, somebody that's a free agent, the best we'd get out of them was three games. Yeah, and unfortunately, like Ordeo is injured, but also Mason McDonald is out for an extended period of time. So even if we wanted to go to the queue and grab McDonald to bring him up, we can't because he's hurt too. <laughs> and, you know, to me, this takes away one of the Flames' biggest advantages if we do make the postseason. I've said it a lot this year. I think one of our big advantages was that we had two solid backstoppers and we could go with either one and change it up on teams midway through a series, you know, even midway through a game if we have to, and it makes it a lot harder to scout the Flames. And if all we've got is Hiller that takes away one of the biggest things that I think has helped Flames get to where they were all year. I agree. And hopefully Ramos' injury is only a minor week-long injury at best. And, you know, if the Flames do make the playoffs, that he can be ready for game one. Well, getting to know Brad Teasen a bit since he's going to be a Flame with us. Uh, he's going to be wearing number 35 for the Calgary Flames. He's a left-handed goaltender, born March 19th, 1986, so he's 29. He's from Aldergrove, B.C., uh, 5'11", 171 pounds. And he's been around for a while, mostly in the Penguin system. Uh, in 2009-2010, he started, played in Wilkes-Barre-Scranton, which is their AHL team, 
and he actually got some NHL time in. Not a lot of people know this. In the 2011-2012 campaign, he played five games for the Penguins. Uh, in that time, he had um, two penalty minutes and 256 minutes in goal and 16 goals against in five games. So not a great showing there, but still some NHL time, so he knows what's expected. Yeah, his last contest, he surrendered eight goals. So Yeah, that's... Yeah, uh, <laughs> not very good. But if he is called on to play, hopefully he has a good game and not get skunked out there because you don't like to see anybody in that struggle especially like an eight goal against performance. Um, so really, I mean, if we have to go into the playoffs, Hiller Teason is our pairing. Uh, first off, I think that kills any chance Adirondack has because they're running with neither of the goaltenders to start of the year with. So that's going to be really tough for them. But as far as Calgary goes, you pretty much have to play Hiller in every game this year. Yeah, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Hiller has elevated his game when called upon like in the Edmonton game or when he relieves Ramo in general. So, who knows? It's one of those things that we'll know how he does once the season's over. <laughs> you know, it seems to me like Hiller has done better this year when he's played in, in must-win situations. Like he's, I think the, of the two, he seems to be the more inconsistent of the two. But he, as you said, he's coming up big when he needs to, and I'm hoping that now he knows I have to come up big for three games in a row. So hopefully, hopefully we're going to see the Jonas Hiller that we've seen, you know, of Anaheim past, not the Jonas Hiller that we saw last year, or you know, in his kind of downswing there. We need to see the playoff caliber Jonas Hiller that we've seen with the Ducks. Otherwise, our thin playoff hopes that we have are going to be dashed right there. Yeah. And Winnipeg has triumphed over the Minnesota Wild, so yeah, fun times. There you go. Less of a shot. Um, anything else about the goaltending situation you want to chat about? No, I just hope that all the guys have a good week ahead, including John Gillies in the NCAA Final Four, and hopefully he... Jankowski and Gilmore can bring home a national championship. That'd be nice. Do you think that this injury is going to in any way affect our... Let's let's make an assumption first. Let's assume that True Living and Ramos people are talking extension. Do you think this injury affects that at all? Not at all. It's a minor groin pull. Like it, it, you got the whole summer to recover. Yeah, it's a week long in or two week injury. Like it, it's just unfortunate timing. That's all. It's not. It's not like a, he like screwed his knee up and like you know r ripped some tendons or something like that. Yeah, broken an ankle or something. Yeah, like that. It, it's nothing like that. If that was the case, then maybe a be a little hesitant but no a, a minor injury like that no yeah no i think you're right i don't think it's gonna affect anything i still think he's a good enough goaltender to bring him back next year and you know maybe he does take some time to warm up but that's where we have the ability to have two great goalies next year and see who's ready to go and maybe we move one of them out uh aside from teasing the flames made two major recalls this week uh Tyler Watherspoon recalled again from the AHL and once again got called up and hasn't played uh, for the Flames since his recall, which is really only one game, to be fair. Do you think Watherspoon finally cracks the lineup this week, or do you think he's destined to not wear a flaming C at all this season? I would expect him, unless one of the other defensemen really, really struggles, uh, I don't see Watherspoon drawing in. Corey Potter played well in the game against the Oilers. Not exceptional, but about the same as the type of performance that Diaz had. So Exceptional is not a word I generally think of when I think of Corey Potter. No, either. and you go with the veterans because you don't need a, a rookie making a mistake. And like even Sam Bennett, having him on the sidelines, it, you as much as you and I might like to see him as fans... You don't want to put him in a 
difficult position unless other players are a, a black hole on the lineup, in which case then you would swap them in. Yeah, and that's the second guy who Matt mentioned. is Sam Bennett got recalled from uh, the OHL. His season ended in the OHL, and they brought him up here. And, you know, I don't think the Flames have any intention of playing Bennett unless somebody's out. I mean, they've had such a deep forward group this year. Um, I think he's just here to be with the team. I think it's good for these guys to be here and, you know, practice with the team and all that sort of thing and get to know the people here. Yeah, if the Flames are desperate, like, say, like, on the last day of the season and they are like they need to win to get in then i could see bennett playing just uh like see if he can contribute any offense cuz he or vice versa if they're out then you might as well play bennett and see what you got true. there true but uh, i don't see the need to throw bennett in there especially with the fourth line as it is of uh Juris, Furland and Granlund playing well against Edmonton, just let them ride it out, and if they can continue their good play, let them do it. Because the thing is, is that as much as we'd like to see Bennett now, if uh, he plays over nine games, then his contract burns a year, and you wouldn't want to see that because of the fact that you're you're going to have Monaghan and uh, Gaudreau their contracts are ending sooner, so it will cause a cap crunch down the line. It It's one of those things that's a little annoying because you'd like to have the top offensive prospect play, but in the 2018 season, the Flames might... There's no strategic advantage to playing Bennett. This exactly, year. and the cap space afforded by having Bennett still on his entry level would be more beneficial, like two, three years down the line, when the Flames are heading into contender mode instead of being right up against the cap. It's sort of like what Chicago went through when they had Taze and Kane and all that under RFA deals, and like once they're second contracts kicked in they had to trade off everybody yeah for sure and and that's as much we have cap space now we have to be careful going forward and making sure we're managing that correctly Mm -hmm. because you don't want to get boxed in it with you know it's just not something that a lot of fans weigh heavily today because they want to see the flames make the playoffs but the flames are doing the right thing by trying to push it off till next year. Matt, I agree with you, and I don't think that there's any, you know, proof or even any real, not even proof, but I don't think that we can say definitively that putting Sam Bennett in the lineup for any one of the last three games is going to help or hurt our playoff chance. No, and that's the thing. You don't know how the young player will respond. He could easily struggle mightily out there and you know, that might end up costing the Flames a playoff spot. So it's a tricky situation. At least you have a nice ace in the hole to play if you need some offense and, like, are in total desperation mode to make the playoffs. Yeah, no, for sure. And it's it's nice he's here. It's good that he's, you know, with the team and learning from them. But, yeah, I'm uh, I'm not in any rush to go and play him. Well, Matt, uh, why don't we talk a little bit, since we're talking about the end of the season and some of these players and, you know, contracts and that sort of thing, let's talk about some of the Flames' free agents. Um, players that the Flames... Really, we've we've re-signed nobody this year. Any of the free agents have yet to be signed, but we have a whole bunch of players between RFA and UFA that we have to re-sign. Uh, let's go through these just quickly and talk about each player just a little bit and see if we think the Flames should re-sign them. And what we expect that player might make. Sound good with you? Sounds like a plan. Let's go. Let's start with the restricted free agents. So just a reminder of uh, what these are for fans. is Restricted free agents are players the Flames retain the rights to. Other teams could make a bid if they want to on that player, but the Flames get the first right to match that. And if the other team does sign them, um, we would get draft pick compensation. And really nobody ever makes deal bids on RFAs because nobody wants to give up the picks. Uh, the first player on that list is Mikkel Backlund. I would assume that he would get re-signed probably in the neighborhood of two million, two and a half for two years. 
Yeah, I, I was going to say about the same. Probably about a $2 million player. I think we've seen a better year from Backlund than we have in the past. He started out hurt. He hasn't played as much, but he's looked more consistent to me than we've seen from him before. Yeah, if he can avoid the early season random injury... Like I, a couple of years ago, it was a broken finger. This year, a torn abdominal muscle. If he can avoid those, then and like get a full season of consistent play, then he would be more deserving of like a three or four million dollar contract. It's just when you're getting half a season and a partial season of him either recovering or playing through an injury, it makes it a lot more difficult to gauge his true value. Yeah, he's making one point five million right now. Um, as of right now, he's played forty nine games this season, ten goals and seventeen assists with uh, plus minus of six, plus six. So yeah, I no, I agree. I think if you give him, you know, two two point four somewhere in there, it's enough of a uh, enough of a raise for him. How long would you want for term on back? Uh, probably two years uh, or whatever it would be to be like right before he becomes ufa he's 26 right now i think you become a ufa at what 30 i don't know the exact okay so yeah i th- i think it's 29 or 30 so yeah as a 26 year old um yeah i i was gonna say 28 or 29 that's kind of when a player especially a forward kind of comes out of their peak twos just when they hit about hit that that time so let's sign him until then and then we can always offer him another deal at that point Exactly, and I don't see any rush to get rid of him or anything like that. It, I think he'd be a good player to have right through the rebuild. And I think even at a two million, even you know two point four, he's a guy who you could still drop down to a two three centerman if you needed to, even at that kind of money. And it's still attractive enough to other teams if we decide we need to move him. He's a movable asset. Yep. Uh, next guy on the list is a guy who's having a heck of a season, a better season than anyone expected, and that's Lance Buma, who's also a restricted free agent. What do you think Buma gets? He's definitely in line for a raise. How much of a raise do you think he I get? would – anywhere around the – if we the Flames could uh, match like what the Flames gave to Curtis Glencross as the maximum, which was four years, two and a half per, I think that's the upper – Ceiling anything less than that dollar wise would be great. Boom is making seven hundred thousand roughly uh, this year, so that would be a huge raise for him. Yeah, I I would expect something around the three year two million per range. Yeah, see, I I don't know that I would go that high off one good year. Uh, I know it's a contract year, and guys tend to get rewarded for the contract year, but I'd like to see them if possible sign them to. Three years, maybe 1.7, 1.8. Give him a million dollar raise, give him 1.7. I just don't know that he's... I mean, if you look at him comparatively to other players in that same $2 million range, I'm not sure that he's proven he can do it. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that it, it depends. And plus, you'd be paying for the intangibles, sort of like how Brandon Prust has a, a $2.5 million contract with Montreal so that's why I think you'd get a little bit more like it's not just that he's scoring 16 goals it's you're getting all the defensive warrior as well in him I have a feeling if there's any guys on this list this might be one that goes to arbitration I have a feeling that his people are going to think he's worth a lot the Flames might not think he's worth as much and this one might have to go to league arbitrator yeah I agree with you there um yeah we'll see but I mean, you know, it's been a great season for Buma. He's played uh, 77 games, 16 goals, 18 assists for 34 points. Best season he's ever had, like all the way back, you know, since uh, juniors. Uh, In 2005, 2006, when he was playing, before he made the WHL, he got 50 points that year. So great season for him. Um, And, yeah, he definitely needs to stick around. I just don't want them to pay too much. For one great season, I'd say you know what, let's do a, a smaller deal, and, or even do less term and say do it again. Yeah, like I wouldn't even mind a one year like two point two five or something. If and let's re go over it next year. Like like yeah, I don't know if I'd go that high on a one year. I'd probably say you know what, I'll give you a million five, 
Show me you can do it again, and we'll give you another yeah. raise. We'll see. Uh, the next guy on the list, another guy who's played the season in Calgary, um, Paul Byron, currently making $600,000 as a flame. Uh, what do you think? Byron gets a raise? I wouldn't sign him. You just let him yeah, go? Yeah, and that's not a slight to Paul Byron. He is a very good depth player. It's just, unfortunately, the Flames don't have many spots on the roster for forwards. And they have too many good prospects coming up. And seeing a guy like, say, Bill Arnold, he could probably slot into the fourth line role next year and contribute just as much as Paul Byron while adding six inches of size. Yeah, I think Paul Byron kind of filled a couple needs for the team, at least coming out of training camp. He filled the depth center role, and he also filled kind of the little guy role. And I think, you know, with Johnny Goudreau uh, taking the little guy role, I agree with you. You could bring up someone like Arnold or, you know, even someone like Granlin might get a full-time spot, and I would be happy with him taking that role as well. Yeah, and that's not to say that Byron wouldn't get a contract elsewhere and I wouldn't even be annoyed if the Flames did actually re-sign him. It's just that the the Flames have a shortage of roster spots at the NHL level, and they need to graduate some guys from the AHL. And Byron would have to clear waivers if he didn't make the team next year, and I think in my mind there's no way he clears waivers. No, uh, exactly. So I probably wouldn't even qualify him. Uh, the way that RFA works is the team has to give a minimum salary. I don't even know what it is. I think it's 10% more than what the player is making this year to retain those RFA rights. Otherwise, that player becomes an unrestricted free agent. I agree with you. I think at this point, not that he's a bad player, but I at least let him go, see if he can get a better offer. And maybe if not, we talk to him after we've given him a couple weeks on the open market. Yeah, exactly. And... Uh... I'm sure that there is a market for Paul Byron because he is a very good penalty killer. And whether that is with Calgary or otherwise is yet to be seen. It's just the Flames do need to delete some players off the roster. Yeah, and of all guys who I think have maybe played themselves out of a job, not that he's played poorly, just that other guys I think have played better and given us a better showing than Paul Byron if I'm looking long-term for this Mm -hmm. team. Exactly. Exactly. Barnes also 25, and you know if you look at a 25-year-old, I think we could get a player who is probably at about the same level as Byron now, who's you know 21, 22, maybe even 23, and has a better upside. I don't see Byron having a huge upside anymore. No, especially when you got guys like Sam Bennett and Emil Poirier that are likely going to yeah. be on the team day one next year. Some people are going to have to you go. You got to get rid of a yeah. center. Some people are going to have to go and you get rid of the easiest to get rid of, and unfortunately, that's Paul Byron. Next guy on the list is another guy who might be on the bubble. We'll talk about him, but uh, Josh Juris, number 86 for the Flames this year. A uh, player we didn't expect to make the team out of camp, and I honestly expect to be sent down at some point, but he stayed here all year. He's making 925000 this year. What do you think is going to be Juris' fate next year? I would resign him probably two years, one-ish million, and see how he does. He played well at the start of his NHL career and has not been as good, especially on the score sheet recently, but he is a very competent hockey player. He does play well with others, and... If you put him on a line with some talented players, he will contribute either with assists or scoring himself. I don't see anything wrong with having him on the team. And, yeah. 12 goals and 12 assists in 57 games this year for 24 points. Um, I don't know. I have mixed feelings on Josh Jersey. He's had a good year. It is a contract year. But, again, a guy who's come out of nowhere and done something good once. And... I would hesitate to give him a million dollars. I mean, if that's what it takes, I wouldn't go any higher than one million, pretty much right on the dot. Um, But I wouldn't go any more than two years on Juris. I think that we might see him slump again and, you know, be banished back to the AHL next year, especially as you mentioned with the, you know, depth that we're going to have on the forward ranks. But a capable guy who's worth keeping around, even as a veteran AHLer next year. Yeah. And it's one of those things. Across the league, there are players that have one good year, and then that's it. 
and this might be Juris's one good year. And he has to come back in July and in September and show that no, what he showed at the NHL level is who he is and is that good. As much as anybody else, he needs to show that he's not just a one-year wonder. Yeah, and that's why I wouldn't go too high on either dollars or term for this guy because I'd hate to be stuck with a stinker long term. Yeah, and that's exactly why it, a million or so, give or take, and see how it goes and let him battle it out with everybody else in training camp. I wouldn't be surprised of the guys we've talked about so far if Byron and or Juris have their rights traded before we get to July 1. Yeah, I can see that. I can see the Flames saying we don't have room for these guys. Let's try to move their rights as part of something else, maybe at the draft. Well, that's the thing. Uh, like, with the Flames having so many good forwards, I wouldn't be shocked if uh, the Flames find a team that has a good number three defenseman that's willing to sell them and we trade two or three or four good forward prospects for that player. Yeah. No, definitely. I, I just don't... Yeah. I, I would hate to see the Flames let go of good talent. Um, But if we can make some out of it and, you know, on their way out the door, why not? Next guy on the list didn't start the year as a Flame. We traded Corbin Knight for him midway through the year. Um, a player who we burned his waiver eligibility. The Flames kept bringing him up and down, so they obviously like what they see. And that's the six foot three centerman, Drew Shore. He's currently making uh, nine hundred thousand this year on his last last year of his deal that was signed by the Panthers. Um, I have no doubt in my mind Shore will be back next year. What do you think? Is uh, about the same, and he hasn't scored enough at the NHL level to warrant more than that. So. Keep him for another two, three years at 900000 or whatever. And see you in September. Yeah, I think he has potential. I see more potential in Shore than I do in even someone like Juris. Uh, I would definitely be okay with a three-year deal on this guy because I think that there's something there. Even if he's not a you know a full-time NHLer, he could be a great depth guy, a great call-up piece, and every organization needs those. Exactly. Uh, someone else we've seen a lot of lately, Michael Furland. Uh, Furland has been with the Flames organization for a number of years now, and he is currently making uh, the same as Paul Byron. He's making 600000 this year. Would you bring Furland yeah, back? Yeah, sure. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that any of the prospects, guys like uh, Bill Arnold, Kenny Agostino, Furland, who are – just coming off their initial contracts, all of those guys should easily get re-upped for the same. Just because it's a work in progress, and Furland has shown enough that he can play in the NHL. Whether or not he sticks long term is yet to be seen, but you know, guys like Arnold and Agostino and Furland, they're all guys that are working on their way up the organizational ladder. I think I would make sure if I was Trill of Insigning Furland that I put a two-way on that deal. Oh, yeah, of course. I'm, all all he those hasn't, guys would be. Yeah, he hasn't earned... I think of all the guys in the in the list so far, he's the only one that I would really insist on it. I'd like it on a guy like Josh Juris, but I'm not sure I could get it. But, yeah, a guy like Michael Furland, you got to have a two-way because you don't know how, how long he's going to be up here next year and you don't want to get stuck with the full yeah, price. I agree. Uh what about David Wolf, guy who signed a one-year deal here in the offseason? He didn't start out great, but has had, I think, a pretty good season in Adirondack. Would you bring Wolf back? Definitely, and I would be shocked if he wasn't playing in Calgary day one next year. When I looked at Wolf signing in the offseason, you and I saw him at the prospect camp, he seemed to me like he was an experiment and a filler guy. And he didn't play a great season at the beginning. I thought, okay, this is going to be a failed experiment. But he's played 54 games for uh, Adirondack, 19 goals, 17 assists for 36 total points. He's really transformed himself into a bona fide North American player. And like you said, a bona fide potential NHL guy yeah, as well. He, in my mind, is the future of the enforcer. Somebody that can and will drop the gloves, will hit, but can actually score and get assists. 
And Wolf in Adirondack, he has actually made plays that are quite creative that you wouldn't expect from an enforcer. Feathering passes through players, sort of like you would expect from a guy like Monaghan or Gaudreau. And at times he's had plays like that in Adirondack. It's not just that he's bulldogging it to the net and banging in the rebounds. Um, he's making 860000 this year. What would you resign him for? Probably league minimum on a one-way and day one start in Calgary. See, I think I'd probably go... I would probably be okay with him. I mean, he's making more than league minimum now, so it'd be hard to get him, I think, to go back. But um, I'd probably do up to about eight seventy-five, do two or three years and put a two-way on it and make him earn his one-way contract. We'll see. Uh, next guy on the list, the guy I've been kind of critical of this year, and that's Max Reinhardt. Um, I'm surprised, honestly, he's still a flame. I expected Reinhardt to be dealt at the deadline. It seems like his spot on the depth chart has been passed by a lot of uh, fellow prospects in this team. But he's still young. He's still a centerman. Uh, he's 22 years old, making 600000 this year. Do you just qualify him for the minimum and give him a yep, new deal? Yeah, exactly. And he had one of the most disastrous first six months of a season that I've seen yeah, I did. any player at any level have. And... Recently, though, he has come out of it in the last, like, 20 games or so in Adirondack. He's been almost a point-per-game player. So, it's one of those things that it might just have been having everything go wrong the first six months, and he's just returning back to form. You give him another contract and see which Reinhardt you're getting. Are you getting the beginning of this season guy who's not very good, in which case you don't keep him? Or are you getting the borderline NHL guy? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd I'd probably sign him to about 700000 give him a two-way, and let him work out whatever he's got to work out there. Yeah. Um, next, next guy who we've already talked about, Bill Arnold, I think we'd... Both probably agree. Uh, qualify him, pay him whatever. He's making eight seventy five now. Pay him less than a million and keep him around. Yeah, same with the next guy, Kenny Augustino. They're both guys that are playing well in Adirondack. They're on their way. It it, it just let's, takes time. Let's finish out the forwards on the list then. Hanowski, same thing. Qualify him and keep him yeah, around. Yeah, even if he's just an AHL vet, it, the Flames do need that in Adirondack or Stockton next year, so I don't see any problem with that, even though he is 26. And Turner Elson? He's making league minimum right now. It's one of those things that if you're going to get rid of an Adirondack forward, it would be Elson, but he is a decent AHL guy. It's just it depends. If the Flames want the, the Stockton Heat to be a more of a playoff team, they might decide to sign an AHL vet, in which case Elson's spot might be taken. Remember that the AHL team can sign its own deals too. So the Flames could let Elson go and he could sign with Stockton on his own, or Stockton could sign that AHL vet, sort of like we've seen with Yonkman this year. And I could see that situation as well. For league minimum, I mean, he's making 550,000 right now. I think if I could bring Elson back league minimum for one year, maybe two, I'd say why not? Even if he had to buy that deal out later, it's cheap to do so. But, you know, I think that's a deal that whether he's playing in the AHL or even if he's kind of a top-end guy who gets demoted to the ECHL, we don't need the contract space. We've got 61 right now of the 80 total contracts we can have. I'd say give him another year. It's one of those things that's a coin toss, whether you keep him or you don't. Because it Honestly, I think a guy like Garnett Hathaway has played well enough where you could probably switch the two guys, Elson and Hathaway, and have like Elson on an AHL contract with Hathaway getting the NHL deal. And you know, you could even, I mean, it's not like anyone's going to jump on Turner Elson in the offseason, don't sign him, bring him to camp, and let him and Hathaway fight for, you know, one contract. Exactly. Let's move to the defensemen then. Uh, got a couple defensemen. Guys that we haven't got to see this year because the Flames really haven't made any defensive call-ups. But uh, let's start with John Ramage. I would just 
let him walk. Uh, he's played okay, adequate at Adirondack. For being one of the older prospects, you would expect him to have elevated his game, and I haven't seen that this year. He's the exact same guy as he was last year. He's slightly better, but you need more, and he hasn't done that. And with the Flames signing Yavenko and uh, Kenny Morrison, along with having guys like Kanzig coming in to the AHL next year. I just don't see the room for him. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, um, you know, he's a guy that had some promise when he came in. Every time I've seen him play this year, he just looks like a run-of-the-mill AHL defenseman. There's nothing that sets him apart in my mind. As you mentioned, we got some some young defensemen coming in who I think could take his spot, and I just see no need to keep this guy around. Like he, I think he's easily replaceable. Yeah. And the next two guys on the list are probably battling for the same contract, which is Senna Akalatsi and Mark Kandari. They're both more or less the same guy, okay in their defensive zone and can generate offense. I would pick one and let the other one go. See, I wouldn't bring either of them back. Um, I haven't been all that impressed with Kandari since we got him. I think he's at that age now where he needs to start showing something he hasn't. I think he's probably destined um, to go over to Europe and maybe make a career there. But I think as a 24-year-old, I wouldn't be bringing him back. Um, and Akalazzi, I don't. again, I don't see a need to bring at least – Maybe qualify him, um, but what's he making now? He's making seven seven hundred thousand. I wouldn't pay him that again next year. I think if you get him league minimum on a two way, maybe, but I wouldn't give him much more yeah. than that. It's one of those things that uh, it's not a big deal. Like if either of them go, eh, who cares? I think on on July first we could sign you know defensemen from other organizations that become UFAs for who. I would want to give a shot to before bringing these guys back. Yeah, and like you got overage guys in the CHL, sort of like Jason Fram, that you might sign and want him to try out. There's other options, and uh, yeah, like if they come back, okay. If they don't, okay. I'd be okay if Akalazi came back. I don't want to see Kandari back. I just think he's been... He's been the worst piece of the Bowmeister trade, and I think it's just time to get rid of him. To me, he just he looks like just a run of the mill AHL guy, and I don't see a need to bring him back. Try him in a new market. He's obviously not working out here, and let's maybe bring in somebody who like a David Wolf, someone from Europe who can impress yeah. us. Either way, it's not a no big loss either way. So who cares? <laughs> And we have a couple UFAs as well. The Flames have some unrestricted free agents who, if we don't sign them, we just lose their rights on July 1st. Uh, Let's start here. Let's start with the blue line on this one. Uh, Rafael Diaz. I wouldn't bother. No, I agree. I uh, I don't know. I think Diaz has been okay. I'd be okay giving him one more year, but I think we could find somebody better. So, yeah, no, I agree with you. I think I'd let him walk on July 1st. See what options are out there, and we can always come back. Yeah, I'm thinking that the Flames might likely acquire a number three defenseman in trade in the offseason, in which case, like, Smead and England, along with Weidman, Russell, Brody, and Geo, like, that's your top seven, and I don't see a need to bring Diaz in as, like, a number eight guy. It, if you did, that's okay, but, eh. Diaz is making seven hundred thousand this year. I he's had a good year, and I can't see him making any less than a million next year. And I don't like him enough to pay a million bucks. That's pretty much my feeling. Like there are other options, and one of the other players that I would actually prefer, like if we're gonna sign one of the guys, it would be David Schlemko. I agree. Um, so there we go. So Schlemko is making one point two seven this year. Um, you'd re-sign him, so would I. What would you give him for a contract? Same ballpark, 1.25-ish, plus or minus. Yeah, I agree. You know, if you get him for a million, that's good. 1.3, 1.4, eh, okay. I think 1.4 would probably be the highest I'd go for yeah, Sanko. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, he's an adequate 6-7 guy. And I, I agree with you. I think a better replacement for a guy like uh, Rafael yeah, Diaz. Yeah, he seems to be an upgrade 
at both ends he does. on Diaz. And I think this was a redeeming year for Diaz. He's shown he can stay in the NHL, and I hope someone else gives him a shot, just not us. Exactly. Uh, what about Corey Potter? If you sign him to an AHL contract and like have him as like an AHL defenseman, fine. If not, fine. <laughs> I think I'd even sign him to an NHL deal like he is now. He's actual Calgary Flames deal, but I'd give him a two-way. I wouldn't sign him for any more than right now. He's making seven hundred thousand. I'd go as much as maybe eight fifty, and yeah, make him that as he was this year, that veteran guy who we can call up if we need the help. But otherwise, he's anchoring the blue line in Stockton. Yeah, that's exactly my thoughts. Let's move over to the forwards then. I uh, got two forwards on this list. To me, neither one of these guys I think is coming back. Let's start with Devin Setaguchi. Uh, welcome to Europe. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think Setaguchi's career in the NHL yeah, is over. I, he didn't even play well in Adirondack at any point. so I could see him sticking around in North America, maybe in the ECHL or the CHL, um, you know, one of those lower leagues, but I can't see him get an NHL or an AHL. No, next year. I would expect him to go like over to Switzerland or something like that and try to build his value back up. And uh, what about the fan favorite here, Brian McGratton? You think they bring him? No, back? but I honestly, I'm not sure if he's gonna continue his NHL career anywhere. I think he might just hang him up and become like a league ambassador or some such. I think, yeah, I agree with you there. I think Brian McGratton. We've seen the last of him in a flaming C jersey. I don't think we've seen the last of him with the Calgary Flames. I can see this guy coming in. Um, you know, he just had a new baby retiring and working with the flames as a community relations guy, or, you know, being a special assistant to the GM or somehow being involved with the well, team. Well, if you look, he had a positive influence on Michael Furland. He actually helped him deal with his drinking problem and got him to become sober. So that if McGratton can do that role either in Calgary or in the NHL in general and be like that ambassador to assist players that are having substance abuse problems, that would be awesome. And I I hope that he has some sort of positive contribution. Me too. You know, I could even see him going living in California, kind of being like a special assistant coach almost in the AHL working with those young guys about, yeah, let's, you know, get you on the right track. Let's make sure you're not getting, you know, addicted to substances. I think that could be a good role for him. Yeah. Um, and then let's move from the forwards then to the goaltenders. Uh, two, two of our four goalies, half of our goaltending core has their contracts coming up. Uh, Brad Thyssen, you bring him back or Brad Thyssen, I guess you bring nah. him back. Uh, uh- I would, because you're expecting that Jonathan Gillies is going to get signed. I I don't see a need. Uh, we'll see. To me, he hasn't done enough to prove that he should come back in that AHL backup role. There's goalies that are a dime a dozen for that Exactly. Role. And you go with whomever, like, you invite several guys to the training camp or development camp and... If any of them knocks your socks off, then bring them in as the AHL backup and go that route. For sure. And the last guy that we have to talk about today is uh, Flames goaltender who currently is injured, uh, Kari Ramo. We're paying him $2.75 million this year, and he's an unrestricted free agent. You think that he gets another contract here? Uh, that's a real tough one. I like Ramo more than Hiller. It's just with Hiller having an extra year on his contract and Ordeo being on a one-way next year, unless the Flames can find a way to trade Hiller, I would probably let Rommel walk. See, I, I this is the toughest one on both these lists for me. I think Ramo has played too well to let him walk. And I think from a PR perspective, a year after letting Cammy walk, I don't think you can let him yeah, walk. Yeah, it that's exactly where I am. It, it, that is the toughest one out of all of them. And the Flames have the cap room. He's making 2.7. I'd offer him 3 million for 3 years and then we have a contract that we could move either him or Hiller. 3 million still a very reasonable price for a guy who could be a number 1 with the right team. True. I, 
boy, that one's really tough, though. Like, if the Flames could uh, go to either Buffalo or Edmonton and get a draft pick for y Jonas Hiller or something like that at the draft, then I, I'd be more comfortable. It's just that... Uh, Nobody's going to trade for a UFA like that at the draft. Well, Hiller's not a UFA, though. No, but sorry. No, for of course. And uh, that's a real tough one. It'll be interesting to see what the management does because that would be the one that I'd be losing some sleep over if I was in Treliving's shoes. I just don't think you can politically let him walk for no, nothing. No, and that's the hard part because you have Ordeo who is ready for the NHL and... Like, how would you say, with Ramo and Hiller, they play different stylistically, with Hiller being a stand-up goaltender, but Ramo is more in the Finnish, Kipper-esque style goaltender, and Ordeo's the same way, so it's tough, because Ordeo, if he comes in next year, having a 1A, 1B of Ramo and Ordeo, you're getting the same goalie basically stylistically and you know what though Ordeo for the last two years hasn't shown us he can start well I mean even if nothing else bring Ramo back start with the 1A 1B of Hill or Ramo let Ordeo get his legs on him if he needs to and then look at moving the goaltender who's not doing as well yeah uh, there's no real definite answer there and I could see the Flames trying several different avenues to solve the problem. I, the easiest one would be letting Rama walk just because you don't have to do anything. See, I'd be upset if they let Rama walk, especially a year after letting Cammy walk. I think you got to re-sign him and then yeah, figure it out. Uh, well, that's like the easiest in terms of doing nothing. That will be the result, and you'll just go with Hiller and Ordeo next year. I don't know. It's really, really tough, and... It, all three of the goaltenders have proven that they're NHL quality. It, it's just hard to figure out which one you would get rid of, of the three. Yeah, I think I'd go 3-5 for three years on Ramo um, and, you know, sort it out once season starts. Yeah. Tell the, tell them you got th we got three goalies, we got two spots. Prove your worth. Yeah. It'll be fun. Yeah. And uh, so those are the players that uh, the Flames have to re-sign this summer. So if you look at that list, uh, Trilliving's got a lot of work ahead of him. Well, not really. It's mostly RFAs, and most of those are easy yeses. So. Yeah, I guess that's true. He's just got a lot of contracts and volume he's got to yeah. get done. And usually, like right around the end of the season, that's when a lot of the guys get qualified anyway. So we'll yeah. likely see that in like the first week of the playoffs. Whether the Flames are in or not. Well, Matt, uh, let's wrap up here unless you got anything else you want to chat about. Nah, I'm good. We're trying something new this year. Um, if you go to firesidechat.ca, you'll see a post on the homepage for the listener survey. You can also go to firesidechat.ca slash survey to get to it. And what we're going to be doing this year is we have a bit of a survey online. We want you guys to take it. It'll take you you know, five, ten minutes to do. And it's really getting feedback from our listeners to find out what you guys want. Um, you know, how long do you want the podcast to be? What do you like that we do in the podcast? What would you like to see changed? What would you like to see added? Uh, do you go to our website and what do you do there? And just trying to get a sense from listeners and, you know, people who go to the website of what, what you guys want to see from us going forward. We're trying to reflect at the end of the year and make things better for next year. And we even have a little prize pack. What we're going to do is we're going to, anyone who takes a survey and fills out their information at the end, you don't have to do that if you don't want to. You can take it anonymously. But if you fill in your info at the end, we'll enter you into a draw that we'll do around the NHL entry draft in June. And uh, we have a prize pack. We got a Fireside Chat t-shirt. We got a Calgary Flames hat and some other Flames goodies that we've got in the in storage here. So we'll post a picture of the whole prize pack on the website. It'll be out uh, same time you hear this show. So go take that uh, survey. We'd love to hear your thoughts on what we're doing. Yeah, and we're always striving to improve what we're doing here at Fireside Chat. And any guide guidance that we can get from you, the listeners, will help us 
present the information better for you so that way you can it, more readily enjoy what we're doing. The show's for you. You know, we're here to guide you guys every week and give you the newest Flames news, but we want to make sure that what we're doing you like. If no one's listening, Matt and I might as well just sit at home and talk. Yeah, exactly. And if you like what we're doing with articles, you want more articles, you want less articles, you want different types of articles, we can do that as well. It's just we need to know what you like, what you don't, and all that fun. We have some big things planned for next season, and we just want to get your guys' feedback so we can ensure that, ensure that the plans we have match what you're looking yeah, for. Yeah, and we are going to be changing the layout of the website heading into next season breaking that right now uh, we're working on it and it that'll be done in the off season so we'll have a new look website and everything will be nice neat and new looking heading into the 2015-2016 season so hopefully you can find 10 minutes out of your busy schedule in the next month to fill this out for us. But again, it'll be at the top of the page at firesidechat.ca or go to firesidechat.ca slash survey. We'll post reminders on Facebook and Twitter, but we hope to hear from you guys yeah, soon. Yeah, and we will give reminders on our subsequent episodes as well just to keep plugging it so that way we can get as much feedback as possible. Well, Matt, let's uh, look at the upcoming week of flames hockey and then let's get out of here for the week we got the last three games of the season we're down to the last uh, week we got six points on the table the flames have the uh, arizona coyotes and the la kings coming to visit us in the dome and then we go on the road for our last game of the season on saturday against the winnipeg jets how do you think we're gonna do i think we're gonna beat arizona handily tomorrow and it's gonna be tough to beat both LA and Winnipeg, but I think the the resilient never say die Flames come out with a full six points and get in not only to the playoffs but home ice advantage for round one. Last week we had four points on the table. Uh, you thought we'd get three. I thought we might get all four, and uh, we got two. So neither of us won last week. This week with six points on the table. I think you're right. We're going to beat the Coyotes. A, they suck. B, we've got a lot of momentum coming off of Edmonton, so I think we can beat them. I'm not sure about the other games. I'd like to think we're going to get six. I'm going to go with four on the week. I think that we're going to win two of the games and lose one. I'm just not sure if we're going to win against the Kings or the Jets. I have a feeling because it's a matinee, we're going to lose against the Jets. We'll see. It's a nervous week this week for the Flames, so hopefully it they is. can... This week could really make or break everything. Like Our whole season comes down to these three yeah. games right now. And hopefully the Flames can show the same level of desperation in those three games that the Dallas Stars had when they faced us twice in the last couple of weeks, throwing everything in the we'll kitchen sink at it to pull out the two points. We have yeah, to now. Exactly. <laughs> You know, and like Hiller's got to step up. We have no other option. Everything has to line up just right or we're done. Exactly. And even if things don't go our way, it's been an absolutely fantastic and awesome season to cover as Fireside Chat hosts. Well, we'll come back next so. week and we'll do our season wrap-up. So we'll talk about that great season yep. then. Have a great week, Matt, and enjoy these last three Flames games of the regular season. Go, Flames, go. And I want to hear the Sal Dome rocking tomorrow. We'll, we'll both be there, so we'll listen to how loud the Sea of Red is. Good night, everyone. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons License. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.